look, I'm a businessman. I won't apologize for making a bit of profit. We do what we need to do for the greater good. A business is, is the backbone of society, you know? And we've got to keep the shareholders happy. If it just so happens that I'm the main shareholder, well, you know. So what if I have to bend the truth a little? Well, I could hardly have let Jacob just leave after his first seven years. He's my best worker. Profits have skyrocketed since he's got here. So, I made a necessary business decision. Congratulations, Jacob. Here's my daughter in marriage. Well, that's not a lie. I know he expected Rachel, but well, he should have known we always married the oldest daughter first. Quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, this one's on him. Read the fine print, boy. That's the first rule of business. Think about how wet behind the ears he'd been if I hadn't given him a bit of you know, tough love. Now, I'm not happy about our new business arrangement, though. My balance sheet is sub. Every time Jake and I come to an, an agreement about his share of company assets, he somehow ends up on top. I have been forced to renegotiate ten times. I'm convinced he's been engaged in insider trading. Either that or I've got a mole in the organization. The other day, I had to strategically redeploy the fittest of my flock to a different field, just to keep one step ahead of things. But when we did a stock take, Jacob still came out with a very favorable portfolio. Maybe there's not a mole in your company after all. I think it's worse. I think we've got a rat. Well, I still can't believe it that you've allowed me to come back. <laughs> uh, I was lonely last time I came, so I, I brought some friends, um, Bessie and Miri and Summer, just uh, to support me uh, this morning, um, just in case. But uh, yeah, so we are thoroughly enjoying the series at Life Church. Honestly, we're enjoying it. Um, we had uh, Reuben over last um, last week, and uh, it was it was a, it was it was a really good message. Um, by the way, Reuben, um, I think out of all the messages, Brad and Jonathan, yours was the best. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh, is this is this record, recorded? Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, now nah, it was good. Uh, we're just grateful to partner with you and uh, have this relationship, as uh, Pastor Ruben was saying, and uh, it's been really good. And by the way, I better behave this morning because the boss is here. Um, so, um, but uh, I'll start off with uh, something to wake you up. All right. So there was this young six-year-old boy who uh, went up to mom and said, mom, where do humans come from? And so mom said, well, son, um, God created Adam and then and Eve, and then Adam and Eve had children, and they had children, and then had children, and that's where we came from. Well, okay. So he went to his dad. He wasn't, you know, quite uh, uh, happy with the answer, so he went to dad and said, Dad, where do human beings come from? Where did we come from? And dad said, well, um, son, um, a long, long time ago, um, there were monkeys um, and, um, and then monkeys had, you know, hair, and then we have evolved from monkeys, and we've lost some of that hair, and then now we're human beings. The young boy was a, a little bit uh, frustrated, so he went back to mom and said, Mom, I don't, I'm not quite happy with, with the answers. What, what's, the, what's the truth? You said that, we, that God, uh, we are created, we came from Adam and Eve, and Dad said that we came from monkeys. What's the truth? And mom said, well, son... Your dad was just explaining his side of the family. I, I'm telling you my side of the, of the family. All right, so I don't know which side of the family you're on, but in this series we've been talking about one particular family, a very interesting family. You're probably uh, familiar with this family by now. As it's, been, it's been, what, four weeks or five? Um, five weeks we've been talking about this um, family. It's a very 
confused family, the family of Jacob. It's a very interesting, if you follow the story by now, this is probably the original soap opera family of the Bible. And uh, not only that, but uh, this family is just one big messed up family. I mean, the story, we find sibling rivalries, we find deception, we find mistrust, we find jealousy, we find lying, bitterness, scheming, the list goes on. I hope your family is not like this family. Well, you're, you're a nice Christian family. So, um, but here's the thing about this family. This is the chosen family. This is the family that God chose to be the family, the lineage of the Messiah. But it's one big broken uh, family. You know, I was thinking about this and I thought, surely God could have picked a much better family? Like a Samoan family? <laughs> I mean, we don't have dramas. Samoans don't have dramas. We have fights. <laughs> and so, and so uh, anyway, I don't know, but... Uh, you know, they, they, they say that uh, true families are not like chocolate fudge, mostly sweet, sprinkled with some nuts. And I don't know, my family, with, I've got Uncle Nutty and uh, Auntie Nut in, in my family, and uh, you've got some of those. So uh, this morning, we're going to read the scriptures. It's episode six, five or six this morning, and we're going to uh, read about the, the dynamics of a family, of a relationship in the family, and the challenges that we find so first thing is, you're familiar with the, this terminology, broken family, or dysfunctional family. A family with conflicts, many conflicts, family with generational problems, family with unhealthy relationships. And so we're now in chapter 30 of Genesis, and uh, we will be covering 72 verses. Are you ready to read the Bible? All right. Let me, let me just give you a summary uh, this morning. And so we're on chapter 30 now, verses 25 to 41. And Jacob starts off with Jacob asking Laban for permission to take his wives and his children back to his home country. Verse 27, Laban realizes that if Jacob goes back home, it's going to be bad business for him. Because in his own admission, that he has been successful as a businessman because of the presence of Jacob. And so he will be the biggest loser because he, uh, in verse 27, it's, he says, The Lord has blessed me because of you. Man, we could do with some Josephs around us, I mean some Jacobs around us that will give us the blessing of God. So Laban makes this proposal. And uh, he says, well, Jacob, how much do you want? Name your price. And, but what he was trying to say is, please don't go. Because if you go, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the biggest, the biggest loser. So again, he starts to get into the bribing and deceiving um, and have the conversation. By the way, Mr. Laban, he is the expert when it comes to, to deceiving people. He's the, he's the master. He's got a Ph.D., in deception. So, PhD, D, with an extra D. Um, and so, <laughs> and so, um, and for 20 years, Jacob's been the victim of uh, Laban's um, uh, deception. So, Jacob replies, he said, I don't want your money. But the funny thing is, in that verse, if you read, in the same breath, he says, I don't want your money, but I want your sheep and your, and your goats. Look at verse 31. Don't give me anything. Just do this one thing, and I will continue to tend and watch over your flocks. Let me inspect your flocks today and remove all the sheep and the goats that are speckled or spotted along with all the black sheep. Give these to me as my wages. Now, he's, he's up to something, Jacob. In the future, when you check on the animals you have given me as my wages, you will see that I have been honest. The guy's claiming his honesty already. If you find in my flock any goats without speckles or spots or any sheep that are not black, you will know that I, haven't, uh, that, that I have stolen them from you. Now, here already the two men are trying to outsmart each other uh, already. 
Now, Jacob, on the, um, on the other hand, comes up with a very, very clever and a very unique animal breeding program, right? You probably read the story. Just in the chapter before that, he, Jacob produced a lot of these babies through Rachel and... Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good. There's some people awake on this side. Rachel and Leah. And now he's moved from producing babies to producing animals. Clever guy. Now, we're on chapter 31. Are you following me with me? Chapter 31 starts off... But Jacob soon heard that Laban's son were grumbling about him. Jacob has robbed our father of everything. Now, Laban's sons enter the family feud. And they are jealous and envious of Jacob because of his exponential wealth. And, uh, and now they're, they're, they're unhappy because it was through, this is their claim, it was through our father that you are now very, very um, healthy and very, very successful. And so the boys are not, are not happy. But here's the thing I want us to pay attention to. Even though Jacob is the brother-in-law of these boys, they're still treating him as an, as an outsider. We need to love our in-laws and treat them nicely, especially the... Yes, the mother-in-law. I don't know why we have this issue with mother-in-laws, but you got to love them. Amen? And all the mother-in-law says, which is most of you, right? Amen. Now, the third problem that we see here is Laban's attitude. Look at verse 2. Laban is not very happy, and Jacob starts to see that there's something a little bit odd about Laban because Laban here knows that he's not going to get rich from this new scheme. So he is not uh, happy um, because of what, what his son-in-law is now proposing. Look at verse 3. God enters the conversation and tells Jacob, Jacob, it's time for you to go back home. And so Jacob did the very good thing. Husbands, listen to this. Jacob, as all good husbands would do, they will be, before they make a big decision, they will talk to their, talk to the, to the ladies. And that's what he did. He called Rachel, he called Leah, and, uh, you know, he's trying to be tactful here because he's, now he's going to say some nasty things about Rachel and Leah's dad, and so he had to say the right, the right thing. And so he gathered and had this family group conference. Have you been to one of those? Family group conference? You don't have them here in North Shore? I've been to a lot of family group conferences in South Auckland, right? My wife went to a family group conference once, and she went to just to pray for one of the ladies and support one of the ladies who uh, new to church, and they, because they, uh, they took three of her children. And so uh, she went to pray for her and support her, and then I got a phone call in the afternoon and say, darling, can you prepare the house? I'm bringing three kids with me. I thought, what? So we had a, I think it was a, a, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a, and a one-year-old baby. I mean, I've, my days of nappies have gone, but I had to relearn how to do all, all of that. And uh, anyway, but um, family group conference. So Jacob starts the conversation with the girls and say, you know how your father has been uh, uh, cheated me for all these for all these years. He's changed my wages for the last uh, ten times, um, and so the girls, the the wife said, "Yeah, do whatever God is telling you to do." Man, I love to hear that from my wife all the time. Go ahead and do whatever God is telling you to do. Look at verse four. Let, let's read verse four. Um, Verse, verse 4, you can see that there's been a change in Jacob's attitude. There's been a change in his growth. Because remember that when I was here last time, he had an encounter with God. And it seems like that was the first time he met God. And God introduces himself to him and told him about he is the, the God who spoke to the father and the grandfather. Now he is talking to um, Jacob. But look at verse 4. 
Jacob comes up with this really nice phrase of spiritual growth and maturity. He says, all of this is happening to me, but God. God is now involved in the life of Jacob. Look at verse 7. He says, but God has not allowed him to do me any harm. Look at verse 9. God has taken your father's animals and have given them to me. There is a tone here that he is now has become a relationship with God, and God is now part of his life. Now, if you remember uh, three weeks ago, I was here, and I told you about four things. Do you remember those things? They all start with P. Yeah? The first one is? Right. Okay. Um, remember how Jacob, um, Jacob said, if God will go with me, presence, and if God will provide for me my clothes and food, and if God will protect me, and if God will take me back to my family in peace, four, four, P, four, P, uh, four Ps. Um, and so this is exactly what is happening here, because in verse 4, you will see that verse 4, God has been with Jacob, presence. He's been with him. Um, that's, what, that's what he's saying. He said, but God of my father has been with me. So this is where you see the faithfulness of God. Not only that, verse 7, God has not allowed Laban to do me any harm. God has been protecting Jacob. And look at verse 9. God has taken your father's animals and given them to me. God has been providing um, for, for, for Jacob. So we see this is the faithfulness of God, even though this guy... It's a very cunning yeah, uh, fellow. One of the things that we see here in, um, in verse 15, the truth that we see in the lives of Jacob is that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is a God that is above all circumstances. Whatever happens to us, God is above all of these things. And we need to place our trust and our faith in God so that whatever happens to us, we have this security in Him that He is faithful. He will continue to provide. He will continue to be with us no matter what happens um, to us. And so in verse uh, 31, Jacob now takes the children, the wives, and on his way home. And Laban had no idea this has already happened because Laban is now on the other side. And look at verse 22, verse, verse 17. And they leave their home. Rachel steals the father's idol. Now Rachel is now catching uh, the whole um, family uh, lies, uh, the whole um, um, family evil of uh, conniving and de deception. We see that in Rachel. Verse 22, three days later, Laban was told that Jacob had fled. So he gathered a group of relatives and set out in hot pursuit. This is like a nice drama. He caught up with Jacob seven days later in the hill country of Gilead. Now, this, is, this sounds like one of those um, John Wayne cowboy movies. Have you ever, who, who knows about uh, James Bond, right? What about Daniel Boone? Yeah, you know, don't show your age, but yeah, Dan Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone was a man. He was a bee. Yeah, all right, good, good, good. So, 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 yeah. Um, verse 24, but the previous night, so just before uh, they had this encounter, the previous night, God appeared to Laban in a dream. Now, remember, Jacob had a dream. God appeared to Jacob in a dream. Now, Laban it's a dream himself. And so the dream, God says to Jacob, I'm warning you, leave Jacob alone. God again is coming to the conversation here and enters and says, hey, I've got Jacob. Don't touch him. Leave him alone. I'm protecting him. Verse 25, Laban caught up with Jacob as he was camped in the hill country of Gilead, and he set up his camp not far from Jacob's. And there, a heated conversation took place. Have you ever had a heated conversation with one of your relatives? 
Yeah? Yes? All right. Okay, there's only a few honest people here. Yeah. And those are not, not nice. Those are difficult when you're, when you're having those tough conversations. And so in verse 26, Laban starts off by having a good go at Jacob. Look at it, verse 26. I, I want you to pay attention to some of the words, and I'm going to emphasize some of the words. Look at verse 26. What do you mean by deceiving me like this, Laban demanded. Deceiving? <laughs> Look who's talking here. How dare you? These are the words, phrases that we use when we have these fights, right? How dare you drag my daughters away like prisoners of war? Is there a war? I didn't know there was a war. Verse 27, why did you slip away secretly? Why did you deceive me? Second accusations. And why didn't you say you wanted to leave? Verse 28, why didn't you let me kiss my daughters and grandchildren and tell them goodbye? You have acted very foolishly. Verse 29, I could destroy you. Wow, sounds like a threat here. Yeah? I could have killed you. That's probably what he's saying. Now let's analyze the conflict. First, there's an accusation here, accusing Jacob of deception. Second, there is an accusation here that dragging the daughters away as prisoners of wars, war. And then there's the, the other one, slip away in secrecy. And he said, you didn't talk to me. There was no consultation. Laban belittles Jacob and calling him a fool. He said, you've acted foolishly. And then the last one is a death threat. Now, maybe you haven't gone that far when you have your dramas and, and do a, a death threat uh, on, your, on, your, on your relatives. But you can see that the toxic environment um, and the conversation that is happening here. Now, and then Laban, one, he said, one more thing. Why have you stolen my gods? Now, remember the story. Jacob has no idea that Rachel has stolen the idol. Um, and so Rachel now tricks her own father. See, see what's happening in this family? Right? Not only the uncles, the aunties, the, the brothers, the brother-in-laws, um, the wives, um, and now the, 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 the daughters to, the, uh, to, to, to their father. Verse 36, Jacob fires back at Laban. And uh, now he's trying to protect his innocence. Look at verse 36. He says, um, then Jacob became very angry. And then challenged Laban, what's my crime? The guy is trying to be innocent here. What have I done wrong to make you chase after me as though I were a criminal? Look at verse 37. You have rummaged through everything I own. Now show me what you found that belongs to you. He has no idea that Rachel has the idol and is sitting on the, on the idol Verse 37, set it out here in front of us before our relatives, for all of them to see. Let them judge between us. Basically, what Jacob is saying, come on, let's bring it on, like David Tua would say. Bring it on, bring it on. And um, this would make a really good uh, post online, you know, a little video clip. Of, uh, but, but that didn't happen because there were no cameras back then. But verse 28, after he defends himself, talks about his innocence, and now he said, I have been faithful all these years. Look at verse 38, for 20 years, 20 long years. Now, if you were really, really angry, you would put another word in front of 20 years, right? But we're Christians here. Uh, look, I have been with you, caring for your flocks in all the time. Your sheep and goats never miscarried in all those years. I never used a single ram of yours for food. If any were attacked and killed by wild animals, I never showed you, um, showed you the carcass and asked you to reduce the count of your flock. No, I took the loss myself. You made me pay for every stolen animal, whether it was taken in broad daylight or in dark night. Verse 40. I worked for you through the scorching heat of the day and through the cold, sleepless nights. How many know 
that when you're having a fight, there are certain words that we need to not use. These are the words that we find in this passage. The first word is I. Don't overemphasize the I. The second word is you. Now, there are two other words, dangerous words. The word is never and always. Just these people here are talking. Right. Never and always. And then, if you put those words together, like I and never, or you and you always, how many know that's not a very good combination? Not a very good combination. But these are the words that has been used here. Sometimes we accuse each other. You're, you're, you're never home. You're always on the phone. You never give me any money. You never listen to me. I think that's the women. That's the women not talking. Yeah. Oh, boy. Now, after, after that, verse 41, he goes on and he says, Yes, for 20 years I slaved. <laughs> the I continues. I slaved in your house. I worked for 14 years. And you changed my wages 10 times. Wow. These guys are just about to have a fist fight. If this was, I was going to say South Auckland, but if this was South Auckland, there was probably a fist fight. All right. Verse 43, but Laban replied to Jacob, these women are my daughters. These children are my grandchildren, and these flocks are my flocks. And everything that you see is mine. Wow. Wow. Mine, mine, mine. These, these guys know how to have a fight, right? And then there was this awkward silence. My background is radio, and if there's an awkward silence on air, it's called dead air. Now there is a dead air. I don't know. That the Bible doesn't say it went on for an hour or two hours or probably a day. Doesn't even say. But verse 44, this is the turning point. Verse 44, Laban says, So come, let's make a covenant, you and I, and it will be a witness to our commitment. Isn't that nice? That these guys have been arguing and fighting, and now they've reached a point where they now say, Okay, I think. It's time to reconcile. Jacob, who deceived his brother, deceived his father, and now is being deceived by the uncle. The, the deceiver is being deceived, but now all of this is about to change. You know, in Galatians 6, verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. This is a, a law of nature. And it also has a uh, spiritual, spiritual connection that we need to pay attention to. You know, if you, if you sow corn seeds, guess what you're going to get? Corn. If you sow deception, guess what you will receive? Deception. And that's what's happening here. Jesus says in these words in Luke 6, verse 37, he says, Do not judge, or you will be judged. Do not condemn or you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be measure back to you. Sometimes we're very quick to judge. Sometimes we're very quick to condemn, but very slow to forgive. Jesus says, for the measure you give will be the measure you will receive back. Now, I don't know about you, but I long for great relationships. I long for good relationships. In my own family, as I speak now, we have some people in our families that we are not talking to each other. And this has been going on for years. We've tried. We've tried. 
and we still, did I just sound like Trump, Donald Trump just then? We tried. We tr- <laughs> just have a look at our immediate families. Are there relationships in our families that needed reconciliation, that we can reach out and have that conversation come now? Are there uncles and aunties that we can say, come now, in our extended family? Or perhaps in your own life, there are some uh, areas of our lives that we need to pay attention to because we need to release uh, forgiveness. In this story, God has been very faithful right throughout. And one of the things I love about the character of God in this story, no matter the, the circumstances that's happening in this family, I am amazed with the mercy of God on this family. I am amazed with God's sovereignty, even though in our human understanding and in our eyes we look at this thing as surely this can't be God. But God in his own way, he is working out his big plan that sometimes we don't see it because we just look at the problems that are happening. But behind that, God is still at work. I'm amazed at the faithfulness of God in this story. In this family, you heard last week this, that the, uh, Leah being so unloved. Uh, she was, uh, what's his name, Jacob, did not love her. And yet it was through that that God brought the Messiah through, um, through, through, the, through her line. Here's the thing that we can see in this passage, in this scripture, and in this story. God still uses imperfect people. God uses dis- dysfunctional families, broken lives, broken families to fulfill his purpose. And if God can use Jacob and Laban and Leah and them, man, that gives me a lot of, lot of hope. A lot of hope. That even though in my own messed up life and messed up family, God reaches out. God is, is a God who is willing to use um, our dysfunctional and our, our, our lives so that his glory will be manifested and his promise will be fulfilled. If you look in the Bible right from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you will find some really broken, messed up people. And you'll think to yourself, how on earth can God use such people? I mean, Noah was drunk. Did you know that? The guy had an alcoholic uh, issue. Abraham was too old. You probably uh, heard this list before. But Sarah laughed at God's promises. She was an unbeliever. Leah was ugly. Oh, there's hope for us. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Remember him? And he was also a murderer. Gideon was afraid. Samson had a had long hair. <laughs> and he was also a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Yay. David had an affair. Elijah was suicidal. Jonah ran away from God. Miriam was gossip. Jo, jo, uh, Thomas doubted the Lord. Job went bankrupt. Remember the story? Mary Magdalene was demon possessed. Peter denied Jesus. The disciples fell asleep while praying in the garden. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced five times, but still Jesus reached out to her. Timothy had stomach ulcers. Who has had stomach ulcers? Paul was a Christian killer. Remember? We are in good company. We are in good company. So, what is your excuse? Are you allowing what is happening to you or happening to your family to be your excuse? I tell you what, God is still in the, in the business of changing lives, of transforming lives. In all our dysfunction, in all our brokenness uh, in this story, God is still involved. God is still present. God still shows up and God continues to be faithful. I mean, if, if this was Laban's attitude and if this was um, Jacob's uh, life, I would not speak to them at all. 
But you will see in this story, God continues to speak to them in the midst of their dysfunction. God continues to bless them, even though they have evil ways. Look at um, the other thing is God continues to work through them, through their, um, through their lives. And so if, if, that, if the God did that to, that to that family, I'm sure God can use you and can use me and our families. That should bring not only hope, but compassion in our hearts. Because sometimes we're very quick uh, to condemn people and look at people's situation. Oh, that woman is evil. But you know what? We have no idea what they're going through. And so we look at ourselves. We also have some things that we are also wrestling with. I don't know. No one knows what you're wrestling with, what your dysfunction is. But in the midst of dysfunction, God continues to function in the midst of our dysfunction. Isn't that good? Yeah. That shows the character of God. That should, for us, should be a a place where we bring thanksgiving to God because of that. Perhaps that is, if we look at that God's nature and God's character, that should help us, bring us to a place of repentance and thanking God. At the end of that verse, of chapter 31. It's a good ending, by the way, because it ends with reconciliation. It ends with peaceful conflict resolutions. I like that. Laban says, come now. Let's make a covenant, just you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. You see, this this drama um, ends in a good place. It ends in a place of peace, and, and resolution and reconciliation. You know, as Christian, God calls us to be peacemakers. This is what Jesus wants us to be, to pursue peace in our relationships, in the, not only in the family, but our relationship in the church and also our relationship outside in the world. Matthew 5, verse 9, this is what Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Wow. We are children of God if we are called to be peacemakers. In Romans 12, verse 18, it encourages us to do, uh, to do peace, to live in peace with people. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let's have a stock take of our lives and where we are. Who are we not at peace with? Don't leave it until your deathbed moment. Make peace with people now. Don't wait until the the last minute, the 11th hour, because that might not happen. God wants us to make peace and, and be peacemakers. Jacob and Laban's covenant of peace, as the Bible says, serves as a reminder, serves as to help us as an example of how to solve conflicts. Let's look at it. At the end of chapter 31, Jacob, at the end, let me paraphrase, they gather the stones. They make a pillar as a witness to their covenant. And then they call on God. In other words, they prayed. Verse 49, they blessed each other. And this is what they say, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent one from another. They met an agreement. And in an agreement, they, they take an oath to respect the boundary line. You know, a lot of conflicts happen in our families because we violate the, the boundaries of respect. There's a, there's a big thing in our Pacific culture about this boundary that I'll probably not go uh, to. But Jacob then also offers a sacrifice to God. Not only that, he invites everyone for a meal. Isn't that good? Got to have food. Got to have food. And then he, not only he invites everybody, but it says that when they had eaten the meal, they spent the night on the mountain fellowship. They had fellowship. They had a camp on the mountain. And then in the morning, they farewelled. Laban kissed the grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. And then they parted. And they lived happily ever after. Now, that's not, not in the Bible, but that's just my version. 
hey, look, no matter what we go through in life, no matter how difficult these problems may be, they can't be resolved. They can't be resolved because we can extend forgiveness and receive forgiveness. I don't know who's in your life that you need to reach out to and, and do the Laban thing. Come now. Come now. Maybe just a, a quick, quick message, a phone call. Reach out and say, Uncle, come now. My daughter, come now. We haven't spoken to each other with each other for over a year or two years. Son, come now. Or dad, come now. Let's be practical peacemakers and take this lesson that we have learned and allow this to be our, our task for this week. Who are, do we need to have coffee, coffee with? Isaiah, as I finish with this, Isaiah says that we've all like sheep and have gone astray. Each of us has turned in our own way. God reached out to us because he wants to make a covenant with us. We were in a massive fallout with God because of sin. The Bible says that we're separated from God because of sin. And God, in the midst of all of that, of our rebelliousness and our evil ways, God says, come now. Come now. In Isaiah, we find those beautiful words. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are, be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is God reaching out to us, offering us reconciliation, offering us forgiveness through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, Perhaps you've never reached out, received that gift of forgiveness, received God reaching out to us. And maybe today, maybe today you can say, God, I want to receive your forgiveness. Thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for wanting to re, uh, bring me back, to reconcile me back to the Father. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for for the cross. And this morning, as we come to the end of, 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 of this uh, message today, will you just close your eyes for a moment and think about what we have read in the Scriptures and where are you in that passage of Scripture this morning? Is there someone that you need to extend forgiveness to? Is there someone that you need to ask for forgiveness? Perhaps you need to receive the forgiveness of our Lord this morning. Can I pray for you? Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are the God who heals you are the God who restores. Thank you that you have given us the greatest example by reaching out to us and forgive us of all our sins through Christ. As Laban and Jacob made a covenant Jesus, you came on the nights before you died and you said these words, this is my blood, the blood of the new and the everlasting covenant. Thank you for this covenant in your blood. Lord, I pray for our church family here this morning. If there's anyone who was going through a, a rough time, with family relationships or just general relationship, God, I just pray. Help us, Lord God. Give us the courage. Give us the strength to put things right, Lord God. 
Thank you that your word says that your grace is sufficient for us. I pray that you will pour out your grace, Lord God, on my brothers and sisters, so that they too are able to bring peace to those struggling relationships, Lord, I pray. I pray for faith that it will arise, Lord God, that we may see peaceful solutions in our families, Lord God. I pray for the humility to ask for forgiveness so that Jesus' life may be manifested in our lives, that he may increase and we decrease. Thank you for your ever, your God who is ever present in time of need. And I thank you, God, for your continuous presence. We thank you. We bless you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.